Hello and welcome to BridgeCast. We're super excited that you all are with us. Um, my name is Joshua Krakus. I'm the founder and president of Bridge Builders STL. We're going to have a wonderful conversation today with Dr. Stan Ricker, um, who worked at Walston Perina in the, the meat processing industry, but also had some really cool um, research that, that we're going to talk a little bit more about food security, about what Dr. Ricker did um, in areas around the globe at the time, and also how we can connect that back to the mission of Bridge Builders. So I know what you're saying, right? What does food processing, what does food security have to do with communities as a whole? But I think you'll see at the end of this episode that there are a lot of intersections. Food is, of course, the building block for communities. And as a community building organization, um, we have to look at all aspects of a community when we're looking at building that community or, or empowering different communities around us. Um, so before we go into that, um, we're going to do our raffle for this week. Um, our raffle for last week that we're going to be pull pulling for today um, is a beautiful handmade necklace from the Sioux YMCA. Um, and we had a couple people do the raffle, so we want to make sure that you all stay up with that raffle. Um, but we're going to choose this one now, and then we'll talk about the raffle for next week. So this is the, the thing we're handing up now, and I'm going to have uh, Dr. Ricker pull for Michelle for donating. Uh, we'll make sure this necklace gets to you in no time um, and we're excited that you were able to participate in the raffle for everyone else who did. Um, please again participate in Weeks Prior. All this money that we're raising with this raffle goes directly to the St. Louis Debris Exchange Program to help send our, our young folks on that program hopefully in the summer of 2021. Um, of course with the pandemic everything's up in the air. Um, but nonetheless, we're trying to still raise money to send our folks to on that exchange program at the most accessible rate possible. Um, the next raffle we're going to do is one that we got a long time ago. I'm going to grab it. We got this a long time ago, and we've been trying to struggle to find the best time to put it out there. Um, with everything going on right now with the pandemic, it is a little bit um, difficult to go out, but I know that uh, we've been trying to keep up to date on the CDC guidelines and how Rock and Jump, which is who sent us these tickets, is keeping a, a good safety distancing, social distancing measures right now. And they have limited capacity, but of course these don't have expiration date on them. So if you want to get them for $5 or four admissions to Rock and Jump, you put them in, put them inside of a Christmas basket, something like that. And it's one of those trampoline parks that's located in um, Shrewsbury, right here in South County. Um, so there's no expiration date on them as far as we can see. They will last, uh, it, again, it has no expiration date. So um, even if you're not comfortable going right now, I recommend getting these and holding on to them for when we can feel comfortable to go back into places like Rock and Jump um, and um, start jumping a little bit. So this would be a great present for younger um, family members or, you know, if you, if you like to play dodgeball, I know that they have trampoline dodgeball and it's a great time. So that's what we're doing right now for our raffle that will be up in a, a graphic um, starting probably tomorrow or so. And you engage with that raffle on www.bridgebuildersstl.org. A couple of other announcements. We're still doing voter transportation for free. And we just made a bunch of um, updates on the website. So we're trying to include more of these videos for BridgeCast in exactly how we can transfer information best to a wider audience. So whether that's about place-based learning, whether it's about the exchange program, whether it's about community building, or including different groups of, um, of videos together in order to sort of uh, make sure that we get the best information possible. So without further ado, let's go right into uh, this interview, and I'm very excited for it. Um, Dr. Rickert, um, I am very excited that you're here and you're, you're talking with us. I'm pleased to be here and I'm <laughs> pleased to be a part of Bridge Builders. I'm on the board yeah. and, um, and I haven't done a lot so far, but I'm learning and I'm willing to work to help out however I can. For sure. So maybe there's something here that uh, will contribute. So, so uh, I got my PhD in food science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1972. Mm -hmm. I spent five years in university work as a professor, uh, assistant professor in, uh, in Wisconsin. 
and then we went to New Zealand where I was a lecturer, which is basically the same position yeah. in meat technology. Um, because before graduate school, I spent some time with Oscar Mayer as a production foreman. And that's where I got my, that's where my interest was founded. So coming back then from New Zealand to St. Louis, uh, I was able to get a, a nice position with, with Ralston Perina Company. And I started out in central research and I actually spent a lot of time with our tuna business. It was chicken of the sea tuna ah. and doing research uh, with them. But then um, after a short while I, I was promoted to uh, director of protein research and it involved soy protein. And uh, Ralston Perina had developed a business starting in about the 1960s on purifying protein from soybeans for food ingredient use. The first big business was uh, infant formula, where prior to that time, they made uh, infant formula that, that um, for babies that couldn't tolerate cow's milk, yeah. and some couldn't, they, they had to have something. So they made a, a, a material out of uh, soybeans, and it wasn't, very satisfactory at all from a <laughs> digestive standpoint in babies. Now, I won't get into details yeah. about that, but uh, uh, they found that with purifying the protein and taking out the undesirable carbohydrates mostly uh, and, and making infant formula from pure protein that it was much more desirable and really uh, mo many doctors, most doctors I think, can considered it every bit as good as that made from cow's milk. Mm. And so actually they ended up with more of, there was a higher percentage of infant formula from soy, uh, soy based infant formula sold than there was a percentage of babies that actually needed it. So <laughs> some doctors call it prescribed it even though the babies were were not intolerant to cow's milk. So that's the, that's the history. And the, and we provided all the protein for that whole industry mm -hmm. for a long time. And it was a very good business because they paid high prices and because they wanted a protein that they could really trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, but then later on, uh, we developed into other food segments. And uh, the, it turned out that the meat, uh, processed meat segment grew the largest, or grew the fastest and into the largest part of our business. It, it became the predominant one. And that's where I became involved because of my background in uh, meat science and technology here, New Zealand, and so forth. And I ended up being responsible for pretty much all the technical aspects of our business. It was uh, developing new protein products for the industry, uh, developing applications technology, how to use it best, mm. and going out and actually working with customers and with other industry groups such as R&D organizations and universities. Yeah. I have good relationships with a lot of um, meat science groups within universities mm. and, uh, because we wanted to partner with the entire industry. That was our business strategy, to be good partners in the business. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it all came about. <laughs> We're happy you all are still with us, right? I, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, with you all seeing this fin finished product, you're going to see like, uh, you know, a nicely tuned um, video, but it just happens to be that everything's happening. So this is our fourth or fifth take on this particular scene, uh, or particular question, because we keep getting interruptions in there. So. Yeah, thank you for sticking with us through the technical difficulties. Um, Dr. Ricker, you are talking about um, working abroad. You are talking about your, your work internationally with Ralston Perino, with the meat processing industry, with soybean protein. Um, how um, do you see this impacting communities abroad? And can you talk to us a little bit about your time working internationally? Okay. Um, yes, our, our approach was to uh, was to be a, as complete a partner with the meat processing industry as we could. 
Uh, we tried to provide value to the meat processors by sharing technology, working with them, even helping them develop new products and so forth. And then we went beyond that and developed relationships with local universities or uh, commercial laboratories, uh, uh, technical, technical groups, and, um, and shared technology that way. So uh, in doing so, I met with, uh, with companies and uh, universities and so forth around the world. Uh, one example that was large business for us in the 1980s was in the Soviet Union mm. at that time. Um, there, uh, they had a, a, a big meat institute in Moscow that uh, interestingly developed the formulas for the, pro for the processed meat products throughout the Soviet Union. They told them how to make it, uh, what to put in it, and so forth. So we worked with them to develop the recipes for the meat products sold within Russia, and we provided protein for them. The, um, what was interesting was their approach, because they had a limited amount of meat, but they wanted to provide as much meat product to, uh, to the public as, as they could. Yeah. So they combined our protein with their existing meat supply and were able to produce significantly larger quantities of, of meat for, uh, for the population. And, and that's the way it worked. But in doing so, one year I made five trips to Moscow wow. inside of a year. Ooh. And uh, over that amount of time, you do develop some good relationships <laughs> yeah. with people. And I had a very good friend who ended up um, now lives in Florida in the United, in the United <laughs> States, but <laughs> he liked, uh, I think he liked the U.S. way of doing things pretty well, <laughs> so he ended up here. But he was a very good friend, and, and, but at that time when he would visit, I often got a call from, uh, from the uh, local, from, it was from the FBI, <laughs> but they would get word that he was coming and, and the FBI would call me and want to know all about the visit and the nature of the business and where they were going and, huh. and so forth. So it was in, this is kind of beside the point, but it's it is, it was interesting. And, yeah, two yeah. main points, right? The first of which, um, when we're talking about young people engaging in our exchange programs, it doesn't have to be just human rights majors or just, uh, you know, philosophy majors or psychology or sociology, but you can have the business majors and the sports marketing and everyone because as we look at intercultural competence, it, it requires a certain skill for even you, you found that you were talking about in your experience of being able to bridge that cultural gap in relationships that are genuine and important in uh, the industry and within the community as well. The second part of that, which is what I'd like us to talk about next, is that I love food, right? And this is a part of the exchange program that is important, is cuisine, and, and one thing that I think is sometimes overlooked in the conversation about culture is that food has an important place in how we look at culture and how we look at um, how communities are structured. With your uh, experience that you were talking about earlier, where do you think this place of food has in communities in your experience of, of working with the Soviet Union, Japan, and other places? Um, but also with you personally, I know you shared a couple interesting stories of me, like for example when you were in China and the story with, um, you know, they had the snake that they brought out, right, maybe, and that, that whole um, debacle. W where do you see food having a place in community? Um, food needs to be available to people. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what do you look for when you when you think about having a meal. I mean, my wife and I can go out to a fancy restaurant and we can drop a hundred dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, the total bill might be two hundred dollars for the two of us going to eat in a nice restaurant. Or, um, or it might be as simple as um, your sister and I having some ramen noodles together. Yeah. And those ramen noodles cost 15 cents a package. And we both enjoy them very much. And they provide a meal for us. So that's kind of a 
big range yeah. <laughs> of food expectations. And, and Rachel and I don't eat ramen noodles because they're cheap. Yeah. We eat them because we like them. And so the most important thing is you need to like the food that you consume. And, and, uh, and people don't want to be forced to consume, consume food that is unusual for them. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes they have to grow into liking new things and, and that's a, an important aspect in the food industry is to provide variety so that people can make those choices. Yeah. So it, it needs to be cost effective in other words, available to uh, the population, whatever it is, and it also needs to be an enjoyable experience. Sure. I hope that gets to where you. It absolutely you gets to there. And I'd like to ask one follow-up question: Is that there's another important quality that um, is a conversation going on right now within activism, and that's food deserts. And I know that this was a relatively new term when we were talking about it before, but. Um, this idea of health being also included in with food and making sure that um, food is available is something that folks like having that variety but also making sure there's healthy options available for communities um, that that might be not be able to go to Whole Foods or, or to some of the more expensive grocery uh, chains. Um, you talked about um, when me and you were talking before we did this interview about how you guys never wanted to sacrifice the quality of the product that you guys were putting out there. How does health play into um, your prior comment about food? Well, we, we made it an important um, business philosophy that we would not sacrifice. We did not want our customers to sacrifice the quality of the, of the products. They could use a lot of soy protein and a little bit of meat and end up with a product that wasn't what customers expected. Yeah. Or they could use a reasonable amount of soy protein and, and produce products that were virtually identical. And at times we had, we had situations where the combination of meat and soy protein actually ended up producing a superior product mm. to what either one would alone. And, um, and I could get into details and describe how that happens and, and uh, or examples of that. But um, usually that happened in what we called the whole muscle products. It was like uh, chicken, um, fried chicken pieces where the a protein solution was injected into the chicken before it was fried and frozen. Mm. And our protein was actually used in one of the largest um, of those uh, fried chicken, frozen fried chicken uh, product lines in the, in the U.S. And we had actual taste panel data to prove that the protein was better with our protein, I mean, the, sorry, the product was better with our protein in it than it was uh, with just plain chicken alone. Huh. So, just an example. We helped the uh, nutritionists, the medical community, uh, to establish what was the value of soy protein in the diet. Mm -hmm. We went from, from essentially proving that it was equal to animal protein, mm -hmm. milk, meat, eggs, and so forth, uh, in terms of nutritional efficiency or nutritional quality. But beyond that, we got into other areas where one was that uh, it, there was a a huge study that was done in the Soviet Union about cholesterol uh, reduction and they and uh, I was involved quite a, quite a lot with that study where they they uh, had men consume these were men with very high cholesterol levels consume soy protein as part of their diet it was like 25 percent of the protein that they would consume and uh, and they had really dramatic reduction in the, um, in the blood cholesterol levels. And that was, at that time, that was a very, very interesting to the medical community. Huh. And, uh, and I personally did it. I, I had high cholesterol and I started consuming a protein shake in the morning, every morning, 25 grams of protein. And I was able for years to manage my own cholesterol level by 
by doing that. I took it down from like 250 down to 200, <laughs> which was acceptable. And I and I still, to this day, I take a protein shake every morning. Mm. That's fascinating. And, and um, connecting bridge builders to this very interesting work that you were doing with Rolson Perina, I know that in um, marginalized communities, but in communities as a whole, um, food health, um, but health as the community as a whole, a public health element is super important. So whether that's high cholesterol, whether that's obesity, whether that is high blood pressure, um, diabetes, everything that is sort of um, lumped in together with public health is super important. And I think that um, making food more accessible that can prove and bring down those, those levels is something that is good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to bring us into one last question before I sort of pass it over to you and anything else. Um, looking at where we are as a community now, I know that you've been retired now for 18 years, and so um, you might not want to put in that thought of like, oh my gosh, I'm already retired, I already spent that time, I don't want to talk about where we're going forward, but I'm still going to ask the question, right? Um, one conversation both from environmental activists, community builders, um, you know, activists as a whole, is what we're going to do with our food. Um, so whether that is uh, looking at food deserts, whether that is changing our agriculture, um, making sure that we use food in a more productive way to feed an ever-growing population. Where, um, from your perspective within your PhD, within meat science and technology, should we be headed in the future um, to, to make sure that one, we have enough food, but two, we also are able to remain sustainable with our practices um, as a community. That was a large question. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's one that I'm still interested in, and I still follow it. Is what should we do with all the environmental concerns that we have, and how can we how can we really feed people better, yeah. um, or as well as they expect to be yeah. fed and still not damage the environment mm -hmm. and so forth. And, uh, and you and I have talked a lot about um, genetic engineering, Indeed. just for example. Yes. And this is one where it kind of, it comes in. Yeah. And um, genetic engineering, GMOs, call it, yeah. genetically modified organisms, um, have had a lot of bad publicity, but, and, and there's much less publicity on the good things that are accomplished from. Uh, for one thing, I was, well, I was thinking about soybeans in particular, row crops, yeah. corn and soybeans, and the, um, the Roundup Ready beans that can, where they can spray Roundup on the fields and they plant varieties that are genetically modified mm -hmm. that, uh, that are able to withstand the plants are able to withstand the Roundup herbicide yeah. and still grow. Well, when I was a kid growing up, we cultivated corn, and about every two weeks, we'd have to pass over the entire field with our tractor and the cultivator in order to keep the weeds down. Yeah. Now, you, you do one application of Roundup, and the weeds are gone for the entire year. Mm -hmm. So, we're not running the tractor as much, we're not burning as much fuel, and we're, and we're actually producing more corn or soybeans from those fields um, because there aren't weeds in the rows anymore. Yeah. I remember when, when, when I was a kid growing up, some farmers had a small enough farm so they could cultivate with their tractor, but that always left weeds in the rows, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Didn't get those. Mm -hmm. They'd be out there with a hoe cutting those weeds out of the rows, and uh, you don't do that with today's big farms, but those hard-working farmers actually did that to get yeah. rid of those weeds. That was before the technology of genetic modification came along. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, there can be so much good done if the technology is allowed to develop yeah. without um, having some of the potentially negative aspects of it highlighted to that point. Yeah. And for me, I never cared whether I ate a genetically modified soybean or if it was one that was so-called GMO-free. Mm -hmm. And we made both kinds. 
that we made for Europe and for the um, the protein supplement industry, which was big in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, all these uh, prepared drinks with a lot of protein in them. A lot of that protein came from our company, and all that had to be non-GMO. Mm. Those people wanted to put it on the label. Yeah. No genetic modified modified protein in this shake yeah. <laughs> and so forth. But for me personally, I would fully accept the risk of more efficient agriculture in order to get more products, more product made to consumers mm. through um, using the technology that we have. Mm. And it's still developing. Yes. I try to keep up with it, but it's hard now not being right in the in the middle of it. In the industry. Yeah. So does that help? It does. Yeah. It does help. makes it uh, more able for larger farms to, to happen and for um, less fuel to be burned through through combines and so on and so forth. And soybean is not only a huge part of protein for humans, but also for the meat industry, right, too, yeah. as, as soybeans is being used to raise cattle and, and pigs and so on and so forth. So again, there's trades off and there's gray area and there's difficult portions of trying to figure out what is the best direction forward for us as a whole, and so I'm, I'm very thankful that you're offering your opinion in that way as somebody with a PhD in the industry. Um, I am, from from my perspective, you know, I think that that's where you and I sort of have the push and the pull, which I think is good. I think it's good that both me and you, and by the way, for anyone listening and might have picked up that Dr. Ricker was talking about my sister, you know, he's my grandfather, right? So it makes sense in, in how we're talking to each other, but it allows for both of us to push and pull in each other where I might be more pushing back and say, perhaps we shouldn't use herbicides, but you definitely bring in the perspective of an ever-growing population, making sure that food is more available for our communities, and I think that that's definitely something that's very important, so I appreciate your perspective very much. Um, I want I always give something to the guests in the very last portion uh, to share what they would like to share. Um, it doesn't have to be what we're talking about. It can be what we're already talking about, but whatever you want to talk about specifically. The mission of Bridge Builders goes, it's very important. It's, it's important that people can build uh, an awareness of how they're different and also, at the same time, build an awareness of how they're the same. And we like to emphasize the same, but there's a lot of room for diversity yeah. in this world. Yeah. So, so that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Ricker, your insight, your um, professionalism, your wide range of experience, not only within the meat industry with meat processing, but the international sphere as in this time the globalization was, was, you know, as a peak as the industries were going larger. And as we see now in the digital age with things getting much closer to one another. Now I can chat with somebody, my cousin in, in Kenya, um, or a friend in Tokyo, right? At all at the same time. And it's, it's getting very important more and more for us to build those partnerships. So I think Ralston Farina's business philosophy in that way was very important um, for our cur current world stage that we need to be working together more than apart, but still at the same time, reckon those cultural differences and figure out how best we can work them together. So I really appreciate your time. Um, and to our Bridge Builders community, thank you again for joining us. Next week, we're gonna have on Dr. Emily Thompson um, who is working in the French department at Webster University, but um, she is one of the founders and current um, professors for the Impact Scholars Program, who Bridge Builders SDL, SDL has been working with for quite some time now. Um, Impact Scholars, the ultimate um, goal of that program through Webster University is to offer first-year students a platform to learn about civic engagements and engage in their community. So of course, Bridge Builders was right up at the front trying to 
and partner with that um, initiative. And now we're doing mentoring for our second year of first year students in that organization. So Dr. Thompson and I are gonna talk a little bit more about where Impact Scholars came from and what we're gonna try and do in the future in partnership with Impact Scholars through Webster University and Bridge Builders STL. Thank you again for your time. We want to make sure that you all are connecting back to our website. So please visit our website at www.bridgebuildersstl.org. Stay connected with us. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or on YouTube. Um, we have our website. So we'll see you all soon. See you all next week. Thank you again.